Okay, this is the uh, political game in civil society in Mexico, Objective 1, and it's about how linkage institutions are represented in Mexico's political culture. Now, if you remember from the beginning of the year, uh, a linkage institution is any group that connects the government to its citizens in some way, and according to political science, there are four basic types of linkage institutions that most countries have. Uh, the first one would be political parties, the second one would be electoral systems, the third would be interest groups, and the fourth would be the media. Now, among those four ways, people can actively participate in their government without actually being in it, and all four are represented in Mexico just with varying degrees of influence. For example, if you take a look at letter A on the outline, uh, political parties are represented in Mexico, and nowadays three parties have a decent amount of influence on Mexican politics ever since the election of 2000 when Vicente Fox got elected. But traditionally it hasn't been that way. Since the 1920s there's really been one uh, party that has dominated Mexican politics. And that one party is the PRI, or the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Now, in Mexico, the PRI basically enjoyed a, a domination of Mexican politics from the 1920s until that election of Vicente Fox in 2000. Uh, PRI candidates during that time were always elected to political office, uh, primarily because nobody else could get in. I mean, there were other political parties but none of those parties could even had a chance. The main reason was because of the way things were set up uh, when the PRI was founded. Essentially, the PRI was made up of caudillos, who were charismatic leaders in rural areas of Mexico, uh, who often questioned the government and could gain a lot of followers behind them. Uh, the caudillos would take care of their people as long as, the, as long as their people supported them in everything that they did. Well, the problem was is that Caudillos started killing each other off for political power in Mexico, and finally they all got together and said, we need to come up with a way to solve this without killing each other so much. So they decided to compromise, and this is on AA2. They, just started, they decided to compromise uh, by uh, forming a system of rotating sesenios, or six-year terms. What they were going to do is let one Caudillo uh, rule Mexico as the president for six years, and then he'd step down, and a new Caudillo would peacefully step in, and they would take turns. Now, that's all well and good, but uh, this became the basis for the PRI. And if you weren't a member of the PRI, or if you were running for office against the PRI, you had no shot, because the PRI was just rotating Caudillos through the presidency every six years. Now, on the plus side... Uh, this was nonviolent. The violence among Caudillos came to an end. Uh, on the downside, uh, the system became based on a lot of corporatism, on patronage. Uh, it was democratic in a sense that uh, you could vote for a PRI candidate, but really not democratic because even if you didn't vote for a PRI candidate, a PRI candidate was still going to get the presidency. And as a result, favored groups who supported them Got, uh, um, got the favors in government. The bottom line was very, very simple. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Now, this is the current Mexican president, uh, Enrique Nieto, and it's uh, unknown what he's going to do because uh, people are somewhat suspicious. He's a PRI member, and after having non-PRI presidents since 2000, in the 2000 and 2006 elections, in 2012, uh, they elected a PRI member to uh, the Sesenio that will last until 2018. And whether or not President Nieto takes the uh, traditional stance about patronage that the PRI has always taken kind of remains to be seen. Now again, just so you understand this part, uh, the PRI uh, has often, uh, and on the outline we're taking a look at AA4 now, uh, the PRI has often been supported in rural areas, where the Caudillos were really strong back in their history. Rural areas have always supported the PRI, uh, usually by less educated, uh, older, and economically poorer Mexicans who still participate quite a bit in the patronage system of 
granting favors for support. This kind of makes sense when you think about it, that it's older people that are involved with the PRI, less educated rural areas, uh, because that's where you know the revolutionary leaders got their start. And, frankly, with those types of people. But throughout the 20th century, as Mexico has started to urbanize, as more people have started to move into the cities, uh, PRI has lost some influence. And that may explain why their, their influence gradually declines in the 90s until you get a non-PRI candidate elected president in the year 2000. Nowadays, the group that uh, has not dominated Mexican politics but has put up a stronger fight is the National Action Party, also known as PAN. Now, we're on A, uh, B on the study guide, or on the uh, outline here. Uh, PAN has been PRI's competition on the right wing, although they haven't always been real competition. They've been around since 1939, uh, but again, PRI always dominated things at that time. PRI, by the way, would be considered kind of middle of the road. PAN would be considered their right-wing equivalent. Uh, by U.S. definitions, they're, they're equivalent to the Republicans, uh, very conservative. They tend to, if you look at AB2, they tend to represent business interests uh, as opposed to, uh, uh, and are opposed to centralized government because that centralized government has always been the PRI. Uh, they're conservative. If you go down to AB4, Conservative by U.S. standards because they want less central authority, more regional control, support for private education, uh, more involvement with religion, specifically the Catholic Church, uh, generally representing business interests. And if you take a look here, they're, they're mostly the strongest in the north in these regions. Now these regions are considered fairly rural, but they do have enough cities to give Pan a pretty good base question is why aren't they more supported or why aren't they more well represented in Mexico City right here which is the biggest city in Mexico well they are to a degree but uh, their tradition uh, in the National Action Party has always been resisting Mexico City and Mexico City's policies because the PRI was the one who had traditionally dominated Mexico City not in terms of support but they were the government making all the calls now, the third major political party in Mexico today is the PRD, or the Democratic Revolutionary Party. Uh, this would be PRI's competition on the left wing. Um, the problem is with them, they, they've made some decent uh, inroads in political uh, um, activity in Mexico. Uh, they had a candidate who finished second to uh, Felipe Calderon in the 2006 election, where the PRI finished a distant third. So they've made some inroads, uh, both in Congress and everything else. The problem is, is that they've always been very poorly organized. So they'll gain some momentum, and then they'll lose it really quick, just because uh, they, they, they don't organize themselves well at all. So the competition that they are providing uh, against PR, the PRI or PAN has been pretty sporadic. Now the PRD, just kind of like the Democrats of the United States, uh, they're left-wing, and they're younger and uh, very politically active. Uh, primarily, they're from central Mexico and uh, uh, around the Mexico City area. And uh, they're typically very middle class, whereas the PRI is a little more poor. Uh, PAN is a little more upper class business interests. Uh, PRD is pretty middle class, uh, gaining support from both urban and rural areas. For example, uh, this shopkeeper is flying a, or I should say hanging, a PRD flag here. It would be somewhat unusual to see the PRI hanging banners all over the place unless, unless it was during an election or for PAN to be doing that. But the PRD is, is generally pretty active, uh, not just as a, ur, an urban movement, but also as a rural movement. Mexican elections... Uh, have been a sketchy issue throughout their, their history. Uh, typically, they're uh, corrupt and fraudulent, especially when they were under PRI domination, because the, uh, the patronage system encouraged a lot of bribery, a lot of swapping of favors, vote for me, I'll take care of you. So they're, they're, they were um, pretty well based on fraud for a good part of their history. Uh, but most positions, if not all positions, in, uh, Mexican in the Mexican government are directly elected. Uh, in urban areas, elections have gotten more competitive. 
uh, in recent years. And in the rural areas, typically dominated by the PRI, uh, it's gotten a little bit better. Uh, so if you take a look at uh, a letter B, uh, items 1 and 2, that's what we're talking about here. Now if you take a look at letter C here about presidential elections, uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, the elections uh, on the outline here are typically based on plurality, which means the first-past-the-post system. Um, they don't really typically vote for a party for the most part and then let the party select uh, um, who, the, who the president is going to be or who the candidates of Congress are going to be for the most part. Uh, the presidency is a um, first-past-the-post position. Uh, there are no runoffs, which is unfortunate because uh, in the Mexican government, a candidate rarely wins the majority of the vote. Most presidential candidates that get elected, because there are enough uh, votes for each political party, most presidential candidates uh, get anywhere from 35 to 45 percent of the vote usually, and you would think that they would knock off the bottom candidates, take the top two, and do a runoff election so you could get a majority, uh, but they don't do that. So as a result, the Mexican president sometimes has a hard time getting support from all the Mexican people because, frankly, a majority didn't vote for the Mexican president. Without runoffs, you can't solve that problem. Uh, Congress does have direct elections. They have a mix of plurality and proportional. For example, in the uh, Mexican lower house, um, they, uh, uh, the Chamber of Deputies, there are about uh, 300 members that are elected by uh, first-past-the-post methods, and about another 200 that are selected by proportional methods, where the party, uh, wh whichever party gets the most votes in Congress, uh, just selects who those people are going to be. We've talked about that before. Um, the Senate has uh, um, 99 senators uh, that are elected by direct election, uh, three senators from um, the 31 states plus the uh, federal district in um, uh, Mexico, uh, in Mexico City actually gets some as well. And then there are some other senators that's, that are also selected by proportional methods. Interest groups are generally very well represented. There are very few conflicts over protest in Mexico uh, because uh, interest groups, group demands are accommodated uh, very well, actually. Um, when they have an issue they want to deal with, the government is, is surprisingly accommodating to them. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more in Objective 2, but as a general idea right now, interest group demands are usually accommodated pretty well. And the media influence in uh, Mexico has not been bad in recent years, uh, uh, as you can imagine. Under PRI influence, it is what you would have expected. From about the 1920s to 2000, if you take a look at letter D on the outline here, uh, they really couldn't criticize the PRI government or say what they were doing was wrong. Uh, again, this would not necessarily be based on violence, but more of patronage. If the newspapers and the media outlets wanted funding for what they were doing and wanted support from the PRI government, well, then they had to support the PRI, which meant sending out the messages that the PRI wanted out, uh, saying that the PRI was great. It was the only way that they could stay in business. Since 2000, though, since uh, we've had uh, two PAN candidates, um, the media has opened up, a lot, well, frankly, been allowed to open up a little bit more, and has now begun a, a practice of questioning the government, questioning the candidates, which has been good and bad. Uh, the PAN candidates were uh, Vicente Fox in 2000, our presidents, I should say, and Felipe Calderon in 2006, tried really hard to promote freedom of the press, uh, but that freedom of the press also bit them a bit and led to criticism. And that freedom of the press uh, may have contributed to uh, Nieto being elected again in 2012, a PRI candidate, uh, because if you're going to allow freedom of the press, you are opening yourself up to criticism. Okay, uh, well, bottom line here is that they have uh, more freedom of the press now in recent years, and they do have access to CNN and the BBC and other major media outlets that they didn't really have before, so that's a good thing. All right, uh, thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, make sure you ask me in class.